Hey everyone, welcome back to our walk through Acts. I hope you enjoyed your weekend. You got a sabbatical from the Bible study yesterday, hopefully to catch up if you're running a little behind. But now we dive right back into it as we're covering the end of chapter 2 today, chapter 2 verses 37 through 47. Let's begin as we always do with our prayer. Join me in saying, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. So, on your apps, on your Bibles, on Google, or watch along on the screen, let's read together our lesson for today again, chapter 2, verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what? Should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. But those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So we start, we left, left off from last time, with the very question that I asked you from the first Bible study. Question applicable to these folks in the story. Question applicable to us. What are we supposed to do? Peter had just finished giving that prophetic speech, the prophecy from Joel, and then telling the gathered men, women, and children who were there for the Pentecost festival that Jesus had died, had died for their sins, and they directly and indirectly had a role in doing that. And so their response, what do we do, is not some sort of, oh, well, flip it, what do we do? And it's not some cynical, yeah, what do you... What do you want us to do about that? I mean, what, what's done is done. It is a legitimate crisis question. What do we do? Same type of crisis when we're faced with end-of-life issues, when we're faced with decision about how, where's our next meal going to come from, things like that, that we know that we have no resources in ourselves sometimes to figure out where those answers come from. So this is a legitimate response to Peter's speech. He has moved them. Remember, he ended his speech last time. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made Jesus both Lord and Messiah, this same Jesus whom you crucified. And so Peter's response, not flippant, not cynical, but very direct and pastoral even, he says to them, Repent, be baptized, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, one and two, they can do. The third one is up to God. We can't just pull a lever and expect the Holy Spirit to come down upon us. Repent, the word, of course, that shows up in the Bible a lot. But the Greek word is metanoia. And it's important to know what repent means, and particularly here in Acts. Repent is not, it, it means literally to turn oneself around, but that process is not something that we often hear and hear other Christians speak about. 
I, I hear many of my colleagues in, in other denominations, and this is not to pick on these denominations, but it is a disagreement I have that they'll have revivals. So they'll have events where they'll have these big altar calls and dozens, sometimes even hundreds of people will come forward at these events and give their lives to the Lord Jesus. The problem with that and the problem from Luke's perspective in Acts is that that kind of repentance is based on an emotional response. Repentance, while emotion is certainly a part of this story, I mean, these men, women, and children are all looking at each other like, what, what do we do? There's this fear, this anxiety that has come up in them, but repentance is very much an act of one's deliberate intellect and soul. It is a matter of one turning oneself. C.S. Lewis gives the image of repentance very well, and he talks about it's a big cruise ship. Imagine a giant cruise ship or aircraft carrier or some massive vessel at sea that that kind of vessel does not turn on a dime 180 degrees. It has to go out a long way and swing itself around, and it's a process that takes a long time to do. In the meantime, as the ship is swinging, the perspective changes. There's all these things that are happening inside the ship as it's switching directions. And that is the same thing with repentance. Repentance is an intellectual exercise for a Christian. It is something in which our mind is reoriented. Our very perspective is reoriented. What we invest our emotional and spiritual energy is redirected. It is not solely an intellectual exercise. I've challenged you from the beginning of this. This is not just something that's just up here, but what is up here is a crucial part of that repentance. So Peter is not telling them to repent based on some sort of emotional reaction. Be baptized. There's a question that comes up with a lot of people, and you're going to hear this throughout Acts. Is, is baptism the precursor to receiving the Holy Spirit? Or is it after you receive the Holy Spirit, or does it really matter? In this passage, it is, Peter seems to be implying that it comes before. But the preposition, F-O-R, or ice as, it's tra as the Greek word, is very vague. It doesn't, you know, you know, we're baptized, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. And then the Holy Spirit comes. It's not really clear as to what the sequence of events is. And in fact, there's a couple of places in Acts where the Spirit is given before baptism takes place. What's important to note in this, before we get to we're trying to strain out uh, the gnat through the strainer, trying to split hairs here, is the act of repentance is first. Getting baptized, just as Jesus was baptized, is necessary. And it's a baptism of water and the Spirit takes place. When we do a baptism in the Episcopal Church, we call on the Holy Spirit as part of that. The Holy Spirit and the baptism of water are right there intertwined with each other. So don't worry about the order of it, but worry that all of those elements are important for the calling. Okay, so I've repented, I've baptized, Holy Spirit's gone. Now what? Now what, what, what's, what's next? Well, we're going to see some of the things that are next, but Peter does not give the systematic theological treatise on what it is that we're supposed to do when we repent and are baptized with water and the Spirit. Repent. That's what we're supposed to do. And keep in mind that repentance, at least we believe in the Episcopal Church, and I know there's a lot of other denominations that believe this too, repentance, as I said, is, is a long event. It is a lifetime event. Repentance is something that we, we do well. Oh, we, we back off a little bit. We have to dodge an obstacle, or we just take our hand off the wheel, and the ship starts sliding back into the direction it was originally going. Repentance is a lifetime thing. So when we say repent, that's it? Well, yeah, because it requires every ounce of us to continue that intellectual, spiritual, emotional, and soul turn away from our own desires and toward what God desires. Peter goes on to say, after those things, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far away, everyone 
whom the Lord calls. And it goes on from there after that promise is made. And it says, so those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added. Well, it sounds just like what I was somewhat critical of a minute ago. Ah, just a mass emotional response. Well, there's two issues at play here. Number one, if you just sort of think about scriptures logically, which you can't do, by the way, if you think about it logically, if Luke was written, or Luke Acts were written in the late first century, after 70 AD, when Christianity is persona or religion non grata in the Roman Empire, don't you think, especially in the context of this story where they are hiding from the authority of the Jewish uh, leaders, but probably also hiding from the secular authorities, all of a sudden they have 3,000 converts who just show up on the streets. Get a little unwanted attention. So some scholars tend to think either Luke overblows the number, which is possible, or ultimately what happens is that 3,000 from that experience are baptized. It's very unlikely that they all happened at once. The second part of that is Luke is, is, Luke is apt to do, again, this is not history written with the precise details that we're used to in our modern and contemporary historical books. He's more interested in saying that there was this amazing response to the message that Peter gave, that Peter's message was full of the Spirit and was so overwhelming and convincing that all of these people in their hearts were convinced that this took place. So again, don't get hung up on the technical details. Get hung up on the fact that what Luke's communicating and what likely did happen in this event was that Peter's speech was so powerful and persuasive it began to lay some seeds either right there at that moment or folks went off and ultimately said, you know what, this message that he's preaching is pretty important. I want to say something outside of the text before we jump into it. So as we get to verse 42 and for the rest of this chapter, I want to introduce you or maybe remind you of something, if you've heard of this, of a concept in Scripture called the Jubilee year. It is something that was instituted in Leviticus on the, on the cycle of seven Sabbaths, of seven times seven years, seven, you know, so 50 years. On the 50th year, there would be what would be called a year of jubilee in which all debts would be canceled, people's original property would be returned to them, people would be set free from all of their obligations to other people. It was a day in which a trumpet was blown and all of the people of Israel were restored to their rightful place from their own choices, from being sold into slavery. Somewhere else they were returned to their rightful place. So Luke's gospel. If you go to Luke's gospel, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to this and I'll have it up on the screen too if you would like to see it. But there in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus first comes onto the scene, he gives this speech, which is a speech from Isaiah, but it's one you've probably heard the story if you have read any of Luke's gospel. It's a fairly prevalent story. It's chapter 4, beginning at verse 16. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, my emphasis added. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What in the world does this have to do with Acts? Well, again, as I remind you, the interplay between the different books of scripture, particularly between Luke and Acts, is very important. For understanding the context. The year of the Jubilee goes back to what we heard when we talked about the prophecy of Joel that Peter proclaimed, that my slaves, my servants would speak 
with the power of the Spirit. And now here in the end of chapter 2, we get into this picture of the believers having this commonly shared community. Very important to keep this image of the Jubilee, and I'm going to say more about the Jubilee, but I'm cautioning and warning you and encouraging you to keep this image in your mind because I cannot tell you how many people, including pastors, that I've heard who have looked at this passage and said, oh, this is advocating communism. Either they're saying it lovingly, like communism is a good thing, or they're saying it as, ooh, this is communism. Maybe we can skip over this part of the text. And so a question comes up here, is this what really happened? Again, here's our historical snobbery wanting to ask, is this what really happened? Is this how this went place? So I'm going to go through and give you some explanation to this as we go through the verses. But verse 42 in Acts, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayer. So all the 120 plus the 12 apostles and now however many that is, 3,000 or less, however many, all are gathering together in this new community. And these four things are very important. The teaching of the apostles, who are given by the gift of the Spirit, teaching that carries the same authority of Jesus and of all the prophets before Jesus, the fellowship, the gathering together, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Those four things constitute the uniqueness of of the community. So again, what do we do? Repent, be baptized, and live with these common features of our community. And that's why these things are all part of the importance of gathering together for church. All came upon everyone because of the signs and wonders being done. And yes, signs and wonders of miracles being done, but also the signs and wonders of teaching that carries such great authority. That is just as important as the miracles that we're going to see take place here very shortly in our next couple of sessions in Acts. Verse 45, they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. This is the communism part. Well, think of it alternatively as this idea of the year of Jubilee that Jesus standing up in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth says, from Isaiah, not from Leviticus, but Isaiah has this image of Jubilee in his prophecy, that the year of the Lord's favor has come upon the people where all people, like in the Jubilee, are freed from their burdens, are freed from their debts, are freed to worship and to be free to love and serve God in all things. Well, Acts, which is very immensely tied up in worldly goods and possessions as part of the outpouring of the Spirit, how we use those is part of the life of the Spirit. It is rather, here is, are these new believers and the apostles all gathering to share their goods with one another to make sure that they are no longer the rich and the poor. There's no longer the slave and the free, but all are equal in the eyes of God. Yes, that is in the theoretical principles of communism, except this is not enforced upon people. This is, you come to join with us in this fellowship. We want to make sure that everyone knows the freedom that is in Christ. Day by day, as they spent much time in the temple, important because the temple, i.e. going to synagogue or going to the temple in Jerusalem, were still an important part of the life of these early Christians. They would have their worship in the temple, but then they would have their worship in the homes of believers. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. This is not an institution of the Eucharist, by the way, as much as we might want to read that into it, but rather just think of gathering with your family. If you have a group of people, whether it's family or friends, when you gather together, it's not just that you share common interests, but these are people whose life and welfare mean everything to you. In essence, Christianity is a very large family. Acts portrays the community full of the Spirit as being a group of people who look out for the welfare of every person 
who was in that group. And they gather together, they praise God, they offer their prayers. And as they do this, and day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Compared with the 3,000, that's what gives me a little evidence to say that the 3,000 may not have all happened at once, but this community very quickly began to grow in its numbers because of the power that was being exhibited through it. So as you look at this story, I challenge you not to say, oh, this is what we should imitate in the early church, this exact practice like they did in this exact place. Remember what I said about the speeches and acts that they were directed to a particular audience at a particular time. But what we can take as the church out of this, among many things, is this pattern of behavior, of gathering and listening to spirit-filled teaching. The spirit guides the creation of the scriptures. It also guides the interpretation of the scriptures. Koinonia, fellowship, where they gather together, is a hugely important thing. The breaking of bread, the sharing of the common meal together as a reminder that we are all in this together, and the prayers which unite us to the God who is in heaven, but breaking through into this world to do amazing things. But most importantly of all, what we can remember is that word metanoia, repent, exercise that is, yes, I need evidence. Yes, I let me discern this so that my repentance is something that is not just solely a flip of the switch based on emotions, but is something I can own, and more importantly, something that I can articulate as a gift that has been given to me. So, gone a little longer than I wanted this time, but there's some amazingly powerful stuff in this passage, and I hope you will dig in and continue to dig in in your own study beyond what I have pulled out for you today. So next time for tomorrow, our lesson is Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. And until then, keep reading, keep praying, keep studying, keep serving the Lord and asking the Lord to fill you with the generous portion of the Spirit so that in all things you may know the love of Christ and show that love to one another. See you next time.